Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Marsh. Yeah, to those who came out tonight, give yourself a round of applause. I mean, we do have an intimate audience, let's put it like that, but uh, I feel like a theater full of energy, e even though the actual physical audience uh, is on the intimate side. But welcome to Monday Night Marsh. Those of you who are here, those of you, the thousands, millions maybe on Zoom, welcome to you as well. But for those of you here in person, thank you so much because live theater it, to me is theater. It's got to be live and we need people in the physical space. So thank you so much. Um, Monday Night Marsh, you never know what you're going to see. All sorts of uh, new and different things that uh, works in progress that people are working on. And our performers tonight will be Malcolm Grissom and Rondon. Uh, we were supposed to have David Zepker, but uh, he wasn't well and he won't be able to make it tonight. So we hope that he gets better soon and that he will be back here for his scheduled performance on the 19th. Um, all right. Um, but before we do anything else, let me just give you all a little bit of uh, Marsh pre-show stuff. If you're on Instagram, so is Monday Night Marsh. We are at Monday Night Marsh. Um, also, for our intimate audience, if you can make sure your cell phones are off uh, so that they don't ring during the performance. Thank you so much. Um, and if you can keep your masks on, uh, we'd appreciate that too. Thank you very much. And uh, hey, just because it's a smaller audience tonight, the, the emergency exit is still free. And not only that, we have two of them, uh, to the left and uh, to the extreme left, where you came in. Uh, okay, so we will do a, a short Q&A uh, with the performers tonight. Uh, so anybody at home on Zoom or any of the folks in the audience have questions, uh, we would love to take them at the end of the show. Um, hey. Uh, Newsflash, uh, if you would like to be on this stage performing Monday Night Marsh, if you think, man, I've always had a great idea for a solo player. I had this amazing thing happen to me at one time in my life that I would like to tell on stage. We are accepting submissions for our July through December uh, 2023 run. So just go to the Marsh, uh, the Monday Night Marsh page on the uh, Marsh website and you can um, uh, find out what it takes to submit your piece. So I hope you all do that, or at least some of you. Uh, and finally, um, we do have shows that are running here right now. Uh, Marga Gomez, who by the way, was on this very stage three times recently, uh, workshopping her new show, Swimming with Lesbians. Um, we'll have three work in progress performances uh, coming at the Marsh beginning next Sunday, June 11th. If you haven't seen Marga Gomez, check her out. She is funny, funny, funny. And speaking of funny, after a long run over at the Berkeley Marsh, um, funny man and just amazing performer, Don Reed is moving his show, The Never Too Late Show, uh, here to San Francisco beginning June 17th. So those shows, more about our shows at the Berkeley Marsh, anything Marsh related at the marsh.org website. Okay. Uh, phones off. I can feel it. I can tell. They are. Thank you. All right. This is what you really came for. Our first performer tonight is Malcolm Grissom in An Evening with Malcolm Grissom. This piece focuses on two short stories that taught Malcolm the biggest secrets of thriving. Now, please welcome Malcolm Grissom. That was odd. Didn't you think so? Really, seriously, I love that music. Do you guys love it? Yeah. Um, okay, so this first story is called Crossing the Finish Line. So picture this. 
I am in college. It's my very last track meet. And the last time that I run the 200 meter sprint, I'm down at the finish, at the starting line, just waiting for that pistol to set me free. I'm off, I'm off, and I'm running faster, faster, and harder than I ever had before. And then all of a sudden, my peripheral vision, I used my peripheral vision, it showed no other runners were even close. So I kept going, I kept running faster, faster, around in the second turn, my peripheral vision again, still no one. Now I can see the finish line ahead. I'm going to win, I'm going to win, I'm going to win. Let me ask you something. You guys know what it takes to win. No? I yes? Don't you don't know? Well, it takes it takes perseverance and passion and patience. As a child, as a child. I was nine years old and I woke up to hear my doctor tell my parents, your son has Ray syndrome. It attacked his brain and liver. That's why he can't walk or talk. He may be paralyzed for the rest of his life. Now, let me tell you, after several works of, after several months of hard work with my therapist, I was able to walk and talk again. And eventually I ran track in high school and college. So to my professional doctors, It wasn't always like that though. I, I um, when, when I grew up, I was often alone because my divorced parents, they argued with each other all the time. And I argued with my mom all the time. And my dad, who I got along with, lived 3,000 miles away. So I was often alone by myself. <laughs> Fast forward to school and running track. Now the thing about the sprints is the person that gets the best start is the person who wins. And I knew that. And it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy at all because I was constantly losing. I would say, coach, I quit. We both know the person with the best start wins the race. I'm disabled. I don't have the best start. I will never win. Malcolm. Winning is not just coming in first. Winning is perseverance. Winning is being on a team, showing up every day, and you have been. You are a winner. Remember, alone is fine. Together, divine.
ever been so angry that all you see is red? Yes, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Maybe it's because you're wearing metaphorical red glasses. Take them off. Try it sometime. I know it's not always easy. And after all, uh, uh, Albert Einstein once said that anger dwells only in the bosom of fools. So don't be a fool. And, and when you're angry, take off those glasses. Don't be like me. I almost let my anger kill me. I was, I, I had a job at the Employment Development Department here in San Francisco, EDD. And my coworkers constantly joked that EDD stood for everyday difference. It stood for everyday disaster. <laughs> I tell you, I mean, first of all, I when I first started, I was delighted though to see the diversity in the office. I mean, there was 50% Asian, 30% Caucasian, 5% African American, and 3% alien. <laughs> And those were the supervisors. They alienated everyone. Except my supervisor. My supervisor wasn't an alien. My supervisor was like the wicked witch of EDD. <laughs> she constantly wore black, had a huge wart on her nose, and she flew around the office on her broomstick. It was a sight, actually. She was like on her broomstick, straddling her broomstick and cackling. <laughs> it was weird. And, and she ate a lot of garlic. Everyone alienated her. Anyway, on my first day, uh, the wannabe witch gave me my own desk, a stack of files higher than the Eiffel Tower, and her blessing. Good luck. <laughs> I started seeing red as soon as that happened. And then not only that, my clients, oh my goodness. I, my first client, Jorge, told me that he was fired for no reason at all. You mean your boss didn't give you any reason? No, man. Well, okay, he did say I was sleeping on the job. <laughs> but I wasn't really sleeping. So were you dozing off or were you actually laying down? Oh, I was laying down. But I wasn't alone. Bunny was with me. You were sleeping with the bunny? No, man, not a bunny. Bunny, his wife. <laughs> More red, frustration. And then my next client, Susan, we were talking on the phone and she told me how she was looking for work every day. She was so, it, she, she was constantly looking for work. That was her life. Meanwhile, I overheard sounds of the ocean and her husband, saying, hurry up, honey. Those sharks aren't going to swim by themselves. 
more and more and more red. And then I had to ask my clients these really confusing questions like, was there any reason other than illness that you could not have worked in a week in which work would have been available, whether it was available or not? Did you understand that? After 20 years, I'm still confused. So I got more and more and more frustrated until I almost had a heart attack. And then my doctor said, you've got to start looking at life differently. So I took off these metaphorical glasses and I searched and I searched for different, different glasses. And I, I tried these. But then everybody thought I was a supervisor. So I didn't want that. So I kept looking. I kept looking. And finally, I found the right fit. And I asked my clients, do you really have the skills that it takes to be an employee? <laughs> Could you lounge on your couch in your underwear for weeks at a time? If opportunity came knocking at your door, would you pretend you're not home? I remembered something in my comedy teacher once said to me, he said, find your funny and the fun will find you. Finding your funny takes perseverance. <laughs> Just like having troubles with this life. Going <laughs> in and out the entire time. My, my last, my last, story, he, he decided to end it prematurely. Like, I told like half the story lights out. Okay, fine. I'm going home. <laughs> but, but seriously, we're talking about finding your funny. So it does, it does take perseverance and it takes patience. But keep trying, take off those glasses, keep looking around for the glasses that will fit you. Because when you find your own, when you find the funny, the fun finds you. Yeah. for unemployment, things might have gone better. Uh, well, he probably would have done some laughing. Anyway, the one and only Malcolm Grissom. He told some wonderful stories here at the March, including those tonight. All right. Uh, now, sorry, our second and final performer this evening is Ron Don in Why White Bird Must Fly. 
This piece is the last will and testament of a flower child. How a San Franciscan rock man laid it all down for us. Yeah, for us, not the US, for us. I just wrecked it. How a San Franciscan rock man laid it all down for us. Become your best cosmic self. Please welcome Rondon. Back in 1969, I went off to college after a 10-hour night shift. And I didn't see many friends that summer. And uh, Woodstock happened that summer, but I wasn't going there. Um, but I had a good, good time nonetheless and found myself in Columbus, Ohio, at Ohio State, where I basically uh, turned on, tuned in, and dropped out. I found myself listening to a lot of uh, wonderful music, uh, marching on Washington, listening to people talk about a revolution. But for me, it was in the music, there was a message that already was bleeding through in the 60s when I was in school, said something about an, a love that we could share. And uh, the rumors of the West Coast, the flower children, Haight Ashbury, all of that was so exciting, you know, thinking something was happening, things were changing. Maybe under the influence of uh, LSD, I found myself more attuned to it. And I thought particularly one record album by a band called It's a Beautiful Day that were from San Francisco, they brought that message in a way that seemed very unusual compared to the other music. It seemed like this should be a show. It was like a cosmic show of, of this Aquarian age that was dawning. And uh, before I jumped on a bus, a Volkswagen bus, and headed to San Francisco, I spent a lot of time contemplating their lyrics as well as other people's. And uh, lately, when I went back to a high school reunion, my 50th, my only one that I ever went to, I decided I was going to try writing it down as a musical. And here's what I came up with. I based it on one of their songs, which was White Bird. And uh, I open it with the first scene, the first song, Bulgaria, which has a line, when you're in a dream, time passes so slowly. In my musical, a guy comes home to his own old apartment, alone, it's just maybe a studio apartment, not many lights are on, takes something out of the ice box, opens it up to drink it, maybe rolls a joint, smokes a little bit of it, and he falls asleep on the couch. And the music lifts up, and these dancers enter the stage, dancing around him playfully, like, trying to wake him in some ways, and then maybe laughing at him also. And the music has the lyrics. Go to sleep on the moment you were born. Open up your mind. Go to sleep on the moment time was born. He wakes up to someone knocking on his door. And it's a friend that's trying to get him to come with him to see an old friend of theirs that they've lost touch with called the White Bird. She's a woman that danced and sang in different bands. And the old guy that he's getting up out of his slumber from that couch, he had a scene with her. He was very close with her, so he knows he'd want to see her. But he's hesitant to want to go. He doesn't really want to go. And it's, he doesn't know how to link up with the past. He doesn't think that that isn't really in his existence anymore. It's too far away. So his friend convinces him to go. And the second song that lifts up is Hot Summer Days, Carry Me Along to the End, Where They Begin. 
And the third act, the third song is White Bird. They find themselves at a club. Still, the friend is trying to get the guy to lighten up, but he's just not feeling it. He's apprehensive. He hasn't been here in a long time. He didn't even think that it was still open, this old club. And then the white bird appears and a song lifts up. She's singing it. The sunsets come, the sunsets go, the clouds roll by, the world turns old. But the young bird's eyes do always glow. They must fly, they must fly. And he's enthralled, he can't believe it. He, he gets up after the number, they're applauding. They go backstage to find her, she's gone, she's left. The next scene, the next song is the white bird home with her friends. They look vaguely like the dancers that were dancing around an old guy in his slumbers in the opening scene. They're talking about like, did you see him? Oh my God, he showed up. You know, I kind of thought he was like out of my life. It's like, oh, okay. one of them's telling her to give him a break. Maybe he's different. Maybe we should have stayed and talked to him. I know they probably wanted to talk to us. And they, she's like hesitant. She's like talking about how, you know, that time period, like towards the end, like realizing what a racist, sexist idiot he was. And just like, she didn't tired of her, that she even got involved with him. But her friends are telling him, remember the other sweeter sides of him than remember the things we share. So she's, she's wondering about it. And, and meanwhile, there's a painting of a girl behind her appearing on the wall. The song that lifts up is, there's a girl in my room, her face on the wall with no eyes. Because it looks like she doesn't have eyes because her eyes are shut. Maybe she's looking inward. Beautiful girl, what does she see? Beautiful girl, she's looking at me. Doesn't everybody know love takes a lifetime? That's the end of the first act. There's an intermission. The next song that opens up, the second act, Bombay Calling is mainly just an instrumental. The old guys, aren't in it, the girls come out, they're dancing in it right off the bat. But then you see them bleed the one guy out that fell asleep on his, on the couch. He still seems to be asleep, but they're kind of like twirling him around and making him like wake up. And they, they teach him to dance in this song. And that's how the second act begins. And then, he lays back down on the couch. It's there and on the dance floor. His apartment seems to be there in the distance. And the second act opens with his friend banging on the door again to wake up. And he's telling him, you know, they're, they're going to be playing another night. Let's go down and see. Him. Let's give him another chance. He doesn't want to do it all over again. He's like Mr. Negativity. He feels like, ah, what's the point? You know, they, you know, maybe they saw me. Maybe they left because of me. You know, wasn't it? It didn't end well with us, you know. And so, as they're talking, they start talking about other things from that time period, and he can't let go of the bad stuff about it. You know how, even though the Vietnam War ended, it was it didn't end well. People were, you know, devastated. The whole nine yards. And as he's telling it, another song starts rising up. It's called "Wasted Union Blues." I'm so tired, I don't know if I can make it. So wasted, I don't know if I can fake it. But something keeps telling me, gotta keep moving on. And then you hear at the end of it, I know if we try, we can make it. So they go. The next scene, they're, they're at the club again. There's a lot more people there. They look like people they've, they've hung out with in the past. Some of them are, other people that they had lost touch with. They, they start talking with them, but the, the band starts playing music and it's getting really intense. And suddenly everyone 
is starting to dance to it. It's like they really get everybody on their feet dancing. And then the lyrics come out with white birds singing again. Time is, that's the song, time is, time is too slow for those who wait. And time is too swift for those who fear. And time is too long for those who grieve. And time is too short for those who laugh. But for those who love, for those who really love, time, sweet time, all the time is eternity. They're dancing like it's the end of the world or the beginning of a world. They're ecstatic. They can't believe it. The band is terrific. It goes on to its finish. They're hanging out, talking again. The tender of the bar is a bar owner. They keep the club open. The people hang out. They decide to just talk and catch up. The last scene of the musical, they're there and just talking things out and realizing how much things have changed. And yet, some things about their ideals when they were young, they see that in young people now, and they think, the world's changing, and but not as quick as people wanted it. But they wonder, some of them, what changes inside of us, and what do we carry with us through our life? And how can we keep sharing that to make the world the place where love is known more to everyone? And as they're talking, the, they head towards the door of the bar. And the old guy, he opens it up first and he looks out and he says to the rest of his friends, it's a beautiful day. And it is, it's a beautiful day. All right, when I'm gone, why don't you come back on stage? We'll give you another round of five. And um, let's see, let's get a couple. We've got one stool out there. I'll go grab another one. So you and Malcolm, okay, now we both sit on stage. Okay. So I wanted to publicly apologize to Malcolm for cutting the lights much shorter. Um, when we do these, a lot of times, I don't know what the performance piece is gonna be, so I try to just time it right, and then this time it just didn't work. Um, I wanted to give you the opportunity if you wanted to do the first act. No. Again, without interruption. No, you guys have to come um, in two weeks. <laughs> I really wanted to give you that I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. No, I, that, this is, um, I, I appreciate your apology, but this is one of the best things about uh, these uh, smaller runs. Um, one, I, you know, because we don't have time. And, and in fact, I was, um, I myself wasn't feeling good, so I was late today. Um, and so uh, there wasn't a lot of time to go for my piece. So, and that's the beauty is that um, we just, you know, go with the flow and whatever happens, happens. And, and so thank you and thank all of you. Well, um, to our intimate audience here, <laughs> any uh, questions uh, for many of you that come up about either of these uh, performers or their performances? Yes, I am single. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ron, um, is yours actually going to be a play with several characters in it? I, I have this... I have a desire to create that, but yeah. then I realized as I was trying to make it happen and I, what limited people I know in the theater business um, and theatrical artists I know and, and different places where they uh, perform, where things can grow. 
And I didn't even think of the bar slide off the bat. I had that even though I'm right here in the hood. But I then began, when I saw the marsh, I thought maybe the only thing this is going to be is just me telling people the musical, you know, my idea. I mean, some people think that the music could stand alone. I added the narration. And I, and I feel like it's, when I went to that high school reunion, you know, I wrote it, uh, I, I was contemplating it a lot before, and I've been studying vocal music too. So I, I was really into like Sondheim and I was singing. And uh, so I was really thinking of musicals. And, it, and then uh, after our high school reunion, which also I got to do a piece from Hair with a couple of my friends that we did at the, uh, in 1969 at class day, you know, we sang a song. Uh, so we sang another song from Hair at our 50th high school reunion, which was, which also brought me into that whole theatrical musical thing. And I loved it. And right after the, the reunion, I just wrote this play down. I couldn't really see it. I just wanted it to be about person that wasn't in touch with the the kind of the the love aspect that was seemed to be flowing everywhere in the 60s and trying to grow through the 70s and, and it's you know how it it just seemed to me like oh, anyway yeah, I was even talking to a friend that has children that were um you know just kind of mad that boomers didn't pull it off you know they didn't make it happen. You know, and I said, yeah, you know, a lot of boomers feel the same way, you know, but but then I thought, you know, I felt that the revolution people were talking about, you couldn't, you couldn't come from the, you couldn't fix things on the outside and think you're going to change people on the inside. You have, people have to change on the inside. I thought the real revolution was like, the music was coming, it was like a human spiritual revolution. I thought that's what was really important. And it's really hard to do that work sometimes and people to really discover things and cultivate it and make it grow. It's it's hard, you know, because the world's always throwing cold water and red angry glasses are being put on quite quickly by a lot of people very often. So uh, I thought it's important, you know, to look back. So yeah, I do. I have, I have the wish that it could be you workshopped into a music where I could get somebody encouraged to do it and maybe by doing a little stand-up routine of it and yeah, yeah. working on it and perfecting it, I'll, I'll be able to do that. I have a part B question. Okay. Um, can you sing the songs? I mean, can Me you sing person? the vocalists? I mean, to, cause I, I'm, I'm humming them along in my head. I'm really yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there, there was an aspect, I thought the, the, the nature of it, I could have, I could have sung some lines instead of just speaking. Mm -hmm. But I chose to speak mm -hmm. and, you know, but I, I would, like, I'm considering that. I also just had, I mean, just to, to pick in my own pity party. Also, I had surgery and a stroke during the pandemic, which was horrifying to me. And this is 2019 with my high school reunion. So I didn't, I, I you know, the, the lockdown and everything was like, I was in actual lockdown. And the, uh, there's like my throat isn't quite as strong as it used to be. So not every day am I like able to like build this, do the Ethel Merman and hit the cheap seats in the back, you know? <laughs> which I love to do. You know, I love to give that aspect. But I do think giving a hint of it would be probably a cool thing. I'm thinking to do that. And maybe we will on our, on our second go now. Thank you. You wouldn't be the first performer that we have on the stage who does kind of like a musical thing with it, and we definitely have the technology to put some music back with you. Okay. So you have that option. Okay. Yeah. That's, uh, as somebody in their 30s, so you made a comment about how you were hearing that all oh, the boomers didn't yeah, yeah. do it all or uh, accomplish everything that they wanted. Yeah. I'm starting to feel the same way as somebody in their 30s, where you know, when you're in your late teens, early twenties, you have all this ambition and this drive to change the world. And then here I am in my thirties and thinking, I think my generation is starting to kind of settle yeah. wherever they're at. Yeah. And now they're kind of putting some of that expectation, or I should say hope, not expectation, but hope on the next generation of kids to do it. That's that's why too, I think that, you know, then it's up to, I think it, people, not only owe it, well, they owe it to themselves, but it's really like you really, you should go, 
you should keep working on what you've cultivated that's good about yourself and not the, and the thing what's uh what's not being achieved sometimes that just seems like it's it's a losing game because the world doesn't allow um you know things to to grow that way all the time not things just don't bloom and stay and flower forever you know it's just like there is a seasonal thing to it but what what i, I think is uh I mean, I really do think that the people do the the youth is the the uh, cultural. You know, they they're the avant garde. They get it, they see it, they bring it, they're inspired and pull it. You know, they do that. They do a lot of a lot of heavy work and they remind people what should be done, but to change it, you know. It's, it's like the whole political machine. I mean, and God love the people that get involved in that. Not everybody's going to get be an activist on the front lines, you know, to change everything. You know, it's done in so many different ways. And, and, and I do think the people who get frustrated with it, maybe, you know, we, we, we're we not seeing our accomplishments. We, we haven't seen what, what was there to really, um, it's passed on. It is, you know, it's with us, it's, inner, it's woven into things, you know, it's like, I mean, I knew people that tried to start an organic farm back in those seventies and couldn't get it together, you know. And got out of that business because they couldn't sell organic vegetables back in the day in the seventies. But now, you know, you, you see organic vegetables being sold. So that part of the revolution is working, even though it's not, you know, totally achieved what its ob object is. Yeah, you know, I don't know. But well, we'll see in, in one lifetime. I have a question from Malcolm. So, Malcolm, I've seen you perform here a, a fair number of times over the years. Do you think there's like, I'm sorry. Do you feel like there's some kind of a theme or, I, mean, I, I sort of feel like there is one, and I picked up some of that, especially in your first piece tonight, um, uh, with your performances. Is there something about your life or the way people have thought about you versus the way you think about yourself? that sort of drives your performances? In general, um, in general, yes. And what is it, I should say? <laughs> is there and what, what is it? Um, it all stems from, um, I, I guess if I was to uh, boil it down to one word, it would be uh, resilience. Um, that's really the theme of the general theme of a lot of a lot of my work. You trace that to anything? Like in your experience? No, not at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I wonder whether, like, the, the physical challenges that you suffered as a child are like a big part of that or not. I mean, from the outside, it's most something. definitely, most definitely, um, physical and, um, and that physical is also unseen because it's I'm still actually it's a permanent disability. It's in my brain, right? I've lost as as a nine year old. I lost a lot a lot of the uh, uh, you know brain cells or you know nerves were damaged or whatnot, and um, and so my disability is one that especially now a days um, when people see me perform and talk and and uh, they don't notice at all that I talk slower than most um, so nobody really knows or can tell my disability unless I tell them you know and um Yeah, and I, I guess I guess that is um, that's a big factor because it's it's not only 
Um, I mean, for me personally, it was the disability, but it's the same thing that other people share with, um, you know, gender fluid, uh, gender fluid youth. They're they're constantly bullied and they don't fit in to this modernistic society and um. And so the whole resilience idea um, is one that I, um, it's one I think that I put down into, into whatever work that I, I do because it's the most universal right now. Um, that pertains to all of us. <laughs> the universal that pertains to all of us. I love it. I love a, a sick mind, don't you? Yes. <laughs> when you're, you're like spewing out thoughts and they're, oh, wait, where did that come from? <laughs> Like, yeah. It's all that stuff because I feel like some of my best writing has come like right after some really traumatic experiences. Like my girlfriend leaving me or my parents getting into a car accident and me not knowing how they are. That's something about kind of being in that. Maybe it's the fact that all the other worries that you have in life kind of get shaped away and you almost get like a clear idea of like how you're truly feeling if it's the only time you really truly feel like oh my god this is yeah this is the work like i'm in a dark dark place do you feel like you maybe tap into some of that when you were writing your piece often when... not now um i've been performing too long um, to go through that process i think um like, okay, so I was, so this happened when I was nine and um, I was um, bullied and everything that went around with that. And uh, so it took many years for me to, just be able to deal with it and come back, you know, come out of my shell a little bit and, you know, say, hi, um, here I am. And um, then I think, well, so then my, my next large venture was actually in 2000. Um, I actually, I've, so I'm, I've always been funny and I had it in my mind that I was going to be a comedian. And, um, and so that's when I started my comedy career. And I think that's when the actual uh, journey that you're talking about really happened because I was still stuck at that point. And a lot of that had to do not only with my disability and what happened um, at school, but also my family life. And um, so I think that's where the entire, you know, letting go of all the other BS that, you know, that was stacked up upon the original BS. And so I, I got down to the original BS, you know, as a comic. Um, and then when I transitioned from stand-up to storytelling, I, I was already at that. I had already dealt with that. So I've already gone through that process. So the stories were clear and you know, I knew where they were and it wasn't really as emotional for me, which made it um, fun to watch. Right. Right. 
So I just had a question. Would we have seen if you won or not? Yes. Okay. Yes. So we would have seen the entire race. <laughs> and so, you know, <laughs> it, yes, it, it, is, it was called crossing the finish line. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it ended like before the race even ended. Oh, yeah. You know? So I was, um, but you know, it happened and that yeah. was a uh, fine open place. Open yes. And so now you have you do have to come back in two yeah. weeks. I know. I already yeah, know. exactly. Put you on your on your um in a sense of get yeah. that right. Yes. Yes. What's really funny is even from the tech of all that, oh wow, he's really cutting this really he got the line that. I'm supposed to cut it off, so but I guess yeah. even warmer. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I um repeat. I repeat um those lines that stick with the audience. You know, right, a couple right. times. Yeah, that can be very powerful. You're right. So, okay. um, do you guys have any? pre-show rituals. I like asking a lot of performers this because um, I am not a performer, but I've done public speaking for school projects and boy, do I get the butterflies, especially mm -hmm. when they call my name. It's almost like, it, you know, uh, I'm fine until they call my name. And then once I'm up in front of people, it's just, I'm really trying hard enough to shake and that's like, stumble over my words. So I like to know from performers who do this, uh, if you have any pre-show rituals or anything you do to kind of get like your mind ready to come out and perform. Take it away. I just really like to try to, and this is what I feel like a lot in, in, about my emotional uh, quality of life. <laughs> I are just learning to, I'm a very emotional person. So I, I feel like sometimes, you know, I just need to know where neutrals at, you know, instead of always putting it into certain gears or like, oh, let's turn this thing down or something there. You know, it's sort of like, no, I don't want to do any of that. I just want to find neutral. And when I feel like the butterflies are coming, because I, I feel the same way. I mean, I, I, about speaking publicly or performing, I mean, I get butterflies. And uh, although I, I think I've always been kind of a show off, you see our home movie. Is that always the one that's instigating something at the dinner table? So, you know, I know I like the attention, you know. So, uh, but on the, but when I get nervous, I just find my coming here was so nice because it was nice to be in a different environment instead of my place. Even though I brought a little my notes with me, so I was reading them in the back, but I just felt like the unusualness of being here while it was quiet. And I had been here before with a lot of people, and it just it felt, uh, friendly, the warmth of this is a meeting place where people come and I just, I felt like I was kind of liberated from my own self in it. I was just in a bigger sphere and that felt nice to be in. It feels nice to be in. So that's, that I found my neutral, you know, I and mean, that's what I look for. For me, I, um, so usually I don't, wouldn't eat uh, for hours before, just so I can, um, just so I can be light. And then when I get here, yes, I do have a, a ritual. I I usually focus on I focus on vocal exercises first, and and then relaxing. Um, or I should say. Yeah, relaxing and then vocal exercises. Um, and, and 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 then sometimes just a, a little I I sometimes I need to look at not the script, but I need to look at how the show is going to go, even if I've done it. 3,000 million times. I still have to do that just so I can, okay, I'm focused. I'm going out there and this is what's happening. 
And of course, none of that happened tonight. But <laughs> that's my usual. <laughs> but you were prepared. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Any uh, final questions before we wrap things up? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> 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 What um what brought you all guys to the to the marsh? I volunteer. I come almost a lot of Monday nights. I like to help out at marsh, and I enjoy working with Arnie and Art, and and uh, so I'm here on Monday nights a lot. Cool, very good. I also come on Monday nights. I come as for guests sometimes. Sometimes I volunteer, but it's funny. Because just tonight I was thinking how much I love coming here and how it, I, I love Arnie's description of you just never know what you're going to get. At the it can go in any direction, any person, any anything, but you always come out uh, feeling a sense of uh, having met somebody, listened to somebody, come out, you laugh, you almost cry sometimes or whatever, but it's, um, it's something that I would like to continue to always do. And I, I don't recommend a lot of things to people, but I tell people about it. But I was just thinking today, I think I would just start recommending. Because yeah. it's really just so, I was always afraid it might not be everybody's shit. You know what I mean? And I, I think it's just, there's something here for everybody always. Mm -hmm. And uh, good or bad or up or down or whatever, it's just such an enlightening experience. I would say in so many ways. And I particularly like now the question and answer period at the end. Yeah. Wow. Because yeah. you really just want to say to somebody, where did yeah. that come from? Or, what are you doing with that? Or how do you feel about that? And and you get to really interact with the person and get to know so much more. So for me, I just find it a, a real joy to come on Monday night. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. yeah. And you? Yeah, for me too. I, I really enjoy it. It's always like a surprise, you know. And sometimes it's uh, really hilarious. And sometimes it's like heavy. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's so bad, it's really, really funny again. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Yeah, okay. I'll say, uh, as I said, I guess we work multiple shows from very big, many uh, different um, levels of expertise. But Monday Night March to me is the funnest wow. day of the week for me because, you know, we're seeing so many different, I'm seeing so many different types of performances in a really small amount of time. Um, but similarly to what they're saying, you never know what you're going to get. Some of my favorite pieces have been condensed in the 20 minute format that we have for the performance. And I like those more than some of the hour long performances I have worked in other events. Mm -hmm. um, and same, the, the Q and A can sometimes be just as powerful as the performances while they're going on mm -hmm. because of how open the performers can be, or uh, they might have a, a great story behind the root of what got them to the end of the paper. Yeah. And yeah, and you just even your uh, your uh, openness to you know talking about you know what had happened, even though you didn't go into detail, um, the fact that you had been bullied and you actually got injured because of it that breaks my heart in a huge way. And the fact that you're able to talk about it openly, it must not be easy for you, even after all this time. No, maybe it is, but the fact that you're willing to share with that in a room full of strangers, I met you. Hour and a half ago, same with these people, and then you opened up. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. And the normal formats, like the, the hour long shows or whatever, they're not as intimate as that. The performers are experienced, so they can tell a great story. Mm -hmm. And we as techs try to help create that for them. But this is this is more raw for me. Yeah. Yeah. And also, if it's really bad performances, she's right. It can be really fun. <laughs> No wonder you were laughing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
gotta find humor in Debbie. <laughs> Well, I, love that, I love that we have the chance to come back. At first, I, as I was getting my own butterflies and cold feet, I just thought, oh man, do they have to do it twice? <laughs> <laughs> but then, like today, at one point, I was like, this is good. Because I felt like I was kind of ready, but even not giving the feedback, it's sort of like what to make it a little more interesting the next time, and you know, and, and, and be more solid with it, and uh, but staying loose. You know, it's like did the questions help with that with the other one of you that you get like feedback or anything to know how you might add or change or depending on what people ask you? Yeah. Well, your question though for the, the singing thing, because I, I know uh my one vocal coach, I, I studied uh before the pandemic, I was studying both uh well, I studied Indian music because I really love Indian music and uh, I was studying vocals in Indian music, so then I thought I should study with the Western vocal coach and she would be broken hearted that I didn't sing anything uh -huh. which uh, you know because yeah. why didn't you give them a taste of it yeah. you know? so your your comment was for yeah. her thank you well any last questions no I don't want to rush anybody but I don't want it to drag it on either well really once again because sometimes when an audience is intimate mm -hmm. You know, I questioned my vow, well, should we do the Q and A? Or, but you know what? It doesn't matter how many people are here. We all have these great Q and A. Yes. Uh, so thank you to the audience for coming for good questions. Thank you to our two performers, Malcolm and Rondon. And um, you know, the idea about you'll be back in two weeks. And I think the thing is when it gives you time to kind of marinate a little bit. Yeah. Make changes if you want. Uh, and get so, some, I'll try to get some of my friends off their feet to come yeah. live and see it live because I agree that live, I mean, I love it if they're streaming, but I think live is really. Uh, and the and yeah. um, every day I'm going to be calling you guys or emailing you and saying, What comes next? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, it's been like Angel Robert Gator right now. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Robert. Robert, well, it doesn't matter because I'm yeah. going to just go ahead and keep going whether Robert turns out the lights or not. I'm saying, no, dang it. I'm here. I'm going to tell this story. I recommend this. The electricity went out once when I was performing on a Monday night. Oh, yeah. Oh. And um, I paused for a second. And then said, "What the hell?" Yeah. Just kept going. Going yeah. pretty good. It was uh, anyway. It was it was sort of fun. But yeah, when you aren't expecting, you, uh, well, uh, when the audience claps too, that's you know, that's, yeah, that makes it yeah. <laughs> clap, 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 and then <laughs> you know. Well, I'll just say as we end, uh, Robert hasn't been at the march for a super long period of time, but one of the I've seen, I've been here a long time, and I've seen people staff turn over a lot. One of the smartest, fastest learning people on the job here, and he does a whole bunch of other stuff at the march behind the scenes. So, uh, you know, every tech has a little mistake here and there, but uh, Robert is a great uh, tech. And you're on the screen. So, thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you.